Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Six at Six lecture. I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU and the host of the Six at Six series. Uh, many of you have been with us through the season this year. We are focused on Black history and culture. Uh, and so it's particularly uh, uh, moving to be here tonight on what is an important moment in American uh, history. Uh, uh, as you uh, almost surely know by now, the uh, Derek Chauvin uh, verdict has come uh, uh, down and uh, we're paying attention to that. And it's a, a particularly uh, uh, coincidental, but uh, an interesting night that our lecture this evening is on uh, justice and injustice in America. So uh, we welcome you uh, to be with us uh, tonight. I want to uh, thank our co-sponsors uh, who have been with us all season that include uh, Thomas More University, uh, the Northern Kentucky Forum, uh, the Barringer Crawford Museum's History Hour, uh, and also uh, the um, uh, Holocaust and Hu uh, Humanities Center at the Museum Center in Cincinnati, a particularly uh, powerful ally to have tonight. Uh, if you have not seen their exhibit, one of the themes that uh, happens there, uh, call outs, is what it means to be an upstander. That is, uh, those people who witnessed the Holocaust and challenged it were upstanders. What's the modern version of being an upstander? Uh, is the question and sort of call to action at that museum. So we're particularly uh, um, uh, happy to be uh, uh, partnered with that museum uh, for this series. We are at uh, inside the uh, uh, Southgate Street School uh, in Newport, Kentucky, a particularly inspirational place to be. You'll see uh, on the set here uh, uh, a school teacher's desk and some chairs for the children who were uh, here immediately after the Civil War. Uh, immediately after the Civil War, within two blocks of where you could see the river that marked the line between freedom and slavery in America, uh, Newport opened a school for the Black children uh, of this community. Elsewhere in the South, the most dangerous thing you could do is educate the children of slaves, and educate slaves and children of slaves. Uh, and there was an effort uh, in Reconstruction to create schools, Freedmen's Bureau schools around the South. Almost as soon as they started, they were being closed. So for a community to come together and say it is important to have a school, it's important to financially support a school and sustain a school is remarkable. Uh, this school stayed open and was so important to generations of African-Americans uh, until immediately after Plessy versus Ferguson or Brown versus Board of Education, the uh, school desegregation case. Uh, the school closed and the students and teachers who were uh, attending here were welcomed into the public school district in Newport. Think about that happening in the mid 1950s when elsewhere in America, desegregation uh, proceeded in courts and uh, with opposition into the 1970s and beyond is something we're not uh, really completely resolved with uh, yet. Uh, the city of Newport a few years ago said, let's open a museum uh, to uh, preserve uh, what happened in this uh, school. Uh, this school is uh, uh, empowered people. Uh, uh, the students who came here and some are still alive. Uh, and we've, our students at Northern Kentucky University have worked with them. And the message that the, those who attended here uh, convey is that uh, the Southgate Street School said, with an education, you can be anything. Get your education and go succeed. And so many of the graduates now in their 70s and 80s that you meet uh, follow that. So this school is incredibly important to uh, the families in this community uh, and is really a significant piece of American uh, history. Our students have been uh, working uh, with the city of Newport and Historic Preservation Officer Scott Clark, who oversees this museum and various projects. Our public history students have helped build the exhibits. We've had public relations students who've worked on uh, messaging for the museum, uh, uh, communication students who've helped build a board, uh, budgeting students who've helped write a budget, uh, and the projects continue uh, even into this uh, semester, and we think they'll uh, continue beyond. If you're in Newport, the museum is closed right now because of COVID, uh, uh, so we'll get past that at some point. But uh, if you're in Newport and near the riverfront, take a look at the flood walls. You'll see a mural that was painted by an NKU graduate that celebrates 
uh, this school. That's the first of, I think, nine murals that will be celebrating, that are celebrating Newport's history. Uh, Newport chose to start with the one that celebrates what happened at this uh, school. And uh, it's been uh, good for us to be a, a part of that, good for our students to not only learn in the classroom, but take what they learned in the classroom and, um, uh, and uh, do it in the real world uh, with community partners. Those students who painted, uh, who worked on that project, heard from the graduates, the attendees of this school, about the story. So when you walk, uh, walk by or drive by that mural, you'll be seeing uh, their interpretation of what they heard from that living history. Uh, so uh, thanks for being with us. We are going to go for about 45 minutes uh, with our talk uh, and uh, then take questions. There's a Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Type your questions into there. Uh, we'll take, begin taking those questions after about 45 minutes and uh, try to dialogue with you. I hope you have a, a lot of uh, questions. We, uh, our uh, panelists, uh, speakers will enjoy interacting with you. So use that panel. And we'll try to give you some reminders uh, as the night goes on. Uh, again, thank you for being with us. And let me introduce our two uh, speakers this evening, my colleagues at Northern Kentucky University. Uh, David Singleton uh, teaches in the Chase College of Law. David also is the executive director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. Uh, he is a former public defender in district, uh, the District of Columbia. And at the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, they work on providing legal services to people who can't afford them. Many of those uh, uh, folks are in uh, prison uh, and in, in need. And it's a, it's a justice initiative that uh, has helped uh, change lives and and uh, get people uh, back into society and, uh, and right wrongs. So it's uh, really important work. And in addition to the work that David is doing with students at uh, Chase. Uh, with David tonight is Danielle McDonald, who uh, teaches criminal justice. Uh, and uh, she uh, has written a textbook on race, class, and the criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, she uh, uh, is someone that my office at Northern has partnered with on a number of things. It's always extraordinary to work with Danielle and her students. Um, uh, and she has a, a, an expertise in what this our criminal justice system looks like, particularly how we incarcerate people. Uh, and uh, what are some alternatives to that? Uh, is the system that we have, uh, it's kind of a warehousing, uh, really the best that we can do. So I think we'll have a, a dialogue about that tonight. Uh, and in the context of this extraordinary night in America. And so thank you for being with us. And don't forget the Q&A uh, um, uh, box at the bottom of your uh, page to give us your questions. David and Danielle, uh, all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. And Danielle, it's a real honor to be here with you. I've obviously followed your work. We've talked before about our mess of a criminal legal system and to be here with you in this space, the South Gate Street School on the day of the verdict in the Chauvin case is, um, it's, it's, it's quite something, right? Just wonder if we could maybe start with the verdict. I've got a lot of conflicted feelings about it. And I'm curious what sort of run to your head. Yes, I, I'm honored to be here with you as well. I have the utmost respect for you and all the work that you do. Um, you've come to my class many times and taken time to speak with my students that voice really appreciated it. And I have a lot of thoughts going through my head about this as well. I mean, we were, you know, I was getting my things together and on my way over here when they were working to get everything announced and out and um, shock maybe is partly what's going through my head. Um, you know, we've had cases in the past where it has been on video. I'm thinking Eric Garner. Um, that was an early you know, chokehold that had been banned by the New York City police, and yet there weren't any charges brought forward. Um, there was another case that did make it to travel. It was in South Carolina, where a man was shot in the back by an officer, um, all on tape. There was no denying that it. There was even, you could see him go lay a gun down next to the guy on the video. And yet he wasn't convicted. It took the federal government coming in and civil rights charges to actually get him convicted and incarcerated today. So on one hand, I was really surprised. I, just a lot of uh, shock, surprise. I'm, I'm glad that there was a verdict and that he was found guilty, but yeah, I'm still really 
Try to process, process it. it. Yeah, how about you? What yeah, are your thoughts? I'm processing it too. And I have to say, I wasn't surprised, although given the other cases that you just talked about, it's not surprising that there are people who are shocked. I think for this particular case, the nine minutes, I know a lot of people who reflect, reflectively support what police officers do in shootings all the time I hear. It's a tough job. It's all happening very quickly. But nine minutes, it, I, I think that was really hard for, I, I just couldn't see the jury com completely quitting. I didn't think he was gonna get convicted necessarily on the top charges. Mm -hmm. um, I would not have been surprised at all if it had been a manslaughter mm -hmm. conviction and no murder convictions. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that bit of it was somewhat surprising to me. I think the, the reason I feel conflicted is on the one hand, I feel good that there's accountability because often there's not, mm -hmm. and police officers seem to, to get a, a free pass, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously the job is difficult. There's no question about that. But some of these killings that happen are just, I don't see how you can defend them. And in case after case after case, there is no accountability. And there's accountability at least this time. Then I wonder, to what extent is this verdict today just putting the Band-Aid on a much larger problem? You know, we have deep problems in policing in this country. I'm not someone who would ever sit here and say all police officers are bad. I don't believe that. My dad was a police officer. I was proud of him. I was proud when I see him put his uniform on. I was a little kid then, but I was proud. Mm -hmm. um, I know people who are police officers who are good um, at what they do and they care, but there's still a problem. And I hope that we don't lose sight of the deeper problems, which includes racism mm -hmm. um, and a whole lot of other problems. So that's why I'm conflicted with it. Yeah, it, um, I have concerns about people pointing to this and saying, well, this is the bad apple. Yeah. You know, this is the bad apple we've been talking about, but, and, and it is a more extreme case, like you said, nine minutes, you know, if you really sit and think for nine minutes, just sit still for nine minutes, it's such an incredibly long period of time That's right. where there was, could have been intervention, he could have stopped. I mean, there's just so many different points where it could have stopped. So. I was hopeful there would be something come out of this, but you know, we just never know. But yeah, that I, I do have concerns about the bad apple thing. You know, we're we do know police officers who are good officers. We knew, we know people who are in leadership positions who are excellent and do excellent work. And uh, but we have a problem. And I think until we can acknowledge that across the board, and it's not just the people we were doing the stand-up job who are acknowledging it, we have issues. And it part of this is leadership, right? The culture is set. No matter what organization you're in, the culture is set from the top down. So as the leader coming into this organization, I have to be saying that we are going to hold people accountable for this. We are not going to allow these things to happen. You know, that you'll never get me to believe that was the first time that Officer Chauvin did that. You know, that he harmed somebody, that he went over the line. He knew that he could, you know, potentially seriously harm somebody. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, there's got to be more to that. And I think we have to really reflect on that uh, before we can move forward and talk about what is really going on with policing, what were the roots of policing, where did this come from? How do we move forward from this? How do we repair the harm in communities where people are afraid, right? When the police comes down, come down the street, there's fear. How do we repair that harm? How do we address the policies that we know are continuing to cause that harm? Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. We absolutely, we've got to roll our sleeves up and, and, and do that hard work. Mm -hmm. I just also have to say this, and, and this may be controversial to some, to some folks who hear this. I take no joy when I hear that somebody's going to go to prison. Mm -hmm. I take no joy in that. Um, you know, I represent people who have done horrible things mm -hmm. and have killed people and have sexually assaulted people. And they have humanity still and you know whenever someone is locked up that's a that's a that's a steep price it doesn't mean that there should be no accountabilities i hope people are not hearing that from me 
but it's still, I don't take joy in it. It's not something I would go out and celebrate mm -hmm. um, and smile about. Uh, incarceration is not going to bring George, George Floyd back. I feel right now deep pain for him and his family and for the community. And I'm glad there's accountability, however that shakes out um, for Derek Chauvin. But it's not something that I um, rejoice over mm -hmm. because that same sentiment of rejoicing when people get locked up is why so many of the people I represent at the Ohio Justice Policy Center, I say we represent at OJPC, it's why they stay in prison so long is because we write them off and we judge them by the worst thing that they've done. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason I'm conflicted. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, one of the things I struggle with with incarceration is that we are just really angry at people. Yes. And, um, we want them to pay, you know, and it, you know, to be harmed, you want there to be some kind of resolution, but I don't know that incarceration really gives you much resolution. It takes that person out of society. If the person's very dangerous, that can be a positive thing, right? You don't want them to inflict harm on other people. Um, but what does the victim really get out of that? I mean, what does George Floyd's family really get out of him being incarcerated? I mean, there's, it doesn't bring their son or, father or whomever back to them. It, it doesn't, you know? So I think we have to really think about that too. And, you know, we're just really angry at people um, that are committing crimes. And we often don't look at why people are committing crimes and what the root of those issues are and how our communities often don't support us, you know? That's right. And that we have taken those services out of the community and put them into the prison system, you know? I, it's so frustrating, you know, and you look at women in prison and, you know, about a third of them are in there for property offenses, a third of them are in there for drug offenses, and why? Why are we doing that? These women, most of them have kids. Yeah. Those kids pay the price, you yes, know, and then we have this constant cycle, and we talk to anybody that works in the system, and they'll, they'll tell you in corrections that I have mothers and daughters, and, you know, generations of families coming through these doors. We are not solving the problem. No. And we want our communities to be safer, but I think a lot of times the policies we put in place make us feel better on the short term. Yes. But they are not long term solutions. And what it does in the long term is it, it, it winds up in us leading the world in incarceration. I mean, we've got 2.3 million people in jails and prisons across the country. We've got the, the highest rate of incarceration in the world. It's shocking that, you know, we're ahead of China on that. Mm -hmm. I have Russia on that, South Africa. Um, and of course, other, other um, de de democracies around it. I mean, we just blow them all away. And I don't think we should be proud of that. No. But yet, you know, when you hear po politicians talk about it, and maybe it's getting a little bit better, but it's this, yeah, we gotta be tough on crime. We've gotta mm -hmm. it, it, it exploit that toughness to get votes. And I just think that that has led us into a bad, a bad place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think there's something like a very strong political aspect of this. Um, and I think part of it's on us too, right? Politicians react and do the yeah. things that they do because they want to keep their job. Right. <laughs> you know, and how do I keep my job? I keep my job by getting people to continue to vote for me. And crime has been such a, an easy, low hanging fruit because it's easy for all of us to come together and just point our finger at these mm -hmm. people and say, look at what they did. You know, and so it's just something that we've done forever. But I think at the same time, we have to stop and reflect on our own actions and our own behaviors. And what, how do we support this? How do we support, um, are, we, are we voting for politicians who are going on our behalf and writing policies or encouraging policies that continue this? Um, how are we involved with the continuation of private prisons, you know? A lot of times we aren't even aware that our stock portfolios, because they're all bunched together, are involved in investing in this. So, you know, there's just lots of different things that we can do. And I think also um, changing that mindset, right, of not being angry at people, but finding solutions for people and also welcoming people back. Mm -hmm. You know, when people come back out of the system, it never stops. It's the scarlet letter, letter of our time. You know, you are constantly, no matter what you do, housing, jobs, school, everybody wants to know, and they want to know what you did, you know, and 
there's nothing else in this world that I would have to go in and say, this is the worst thing I ever did in my life. Will you hire me for this job? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just the reality yeah. of it. No one would ever ask me to do that. It would never be an expectation because I don't have to write on my paper that I have that many. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're applying for jobs to cash your at Target or you're applying for a professor, you have to turn in these background checks and do these mm -hmm. things. And so, you know, we as a society have to welcome people back. We have to be willing to hire people, work with people, offer people housing. You know, I think we play a part in it too. We absolutely do. I, you're talking about people welcoming people back and I don't know the, the exact number. And I'm not gonna tell you the exact number for Ohio, but I'll give you a ballpark. And so you may know the number for Kentucky. In Ohio, we've got over a thousand laws on the, on the books in the state of Ohio that our legislators have passed that restrict the ability of people with criminal records to work in certain industries or fields and hold um, uh, professional licenses. That's insane. Mm -hmm. That's insane. People are shocked. Whenever I go out and I speak about this, I ask people to in the audience, how many laws do you think are on the books? Some people say 20. Uh, some will say 100, 200, nobody guesses a thousand, um, and it's more than a thousand. And how can we expect people to succeed if we are throwing up roadblocks? Um, it's, just, it's punishment that just never ends. You know, one thing you might learn how to do in prison is cut hair, and yet you might be denied the barber's license for that. If you have construction skills, maybe you want to start your own business. In the state of Ohio, you can't own your own construction uh, business if you've got a felony conviction. Um, and so, some restrictions may make more sense than others, but I think we really need to be looking at individuals rather than just that 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 scarlet scar letter that you refer to that they have yeah. and just writing them all. Yeah. I mean, we put so many laws on the books in the 80s and 90s just to keep punishing people over and over. Everything from taking social services away yeah. to you know unemployment. So you come out and you've got kids you have to feed, but you can't get housing because you have criminal record. You can't get a job because you've criminal record. You can't get social services. You know the places that all of us would go if we ever had an issue. If I had an issue with housing, we'd go to HUD. You can't get housing there. If you you know need help with you know all these other different things, education, student loans, it's difficult to get student loans if you have drug offenses, all these different things, all these barriers, it's absolutely impossible. And the people who are able to succeed and be successful through that, I mean, they could move mountains. Yes, they could. You know, I mean, that that's the reality of it. And I'm happy for them that they're able to do that, but why are we asking them to do that? And think of all the people who fail because we are asking them to move mountains. It's just... Right. The insanity of that and so you just keep coming back in you go out you come right back in i mean it's just this constant constant cycle and we lose sight i think you mentioned it earlier about how some of these um punishments hurt innocent people mm -hmm. um people family members of, of folks who are incarcerated one of the most heartbreaking cases i had was a woman who because of her criminal conviction she and her five kids could not live in public houses uh, they were homeless at one point and i had to rush and find ways to, to just get them off the streets and it's just no way to live mm -hmm. um, no way to live and that has a, a, a tremendous impact not only on the woman i represented but those young kids yeah what kind of message are we sending um those young children mm -hmm. some may say well you're 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 sending them a message that that if they run all the wall, there are going to be consequences really is that the matter? I mean, that's what we're saying is you are not worth worthy. Your mother is not worthy, and you're not worth. Mm -hmm. And that that causes damage to people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely yeah. does. Yeah, that is absolutely a message of we do not care. You know, if, if you're willing to allow something like that to happen, and it, it's it's such a problem for everybody. I you know working in here around this area with programs with folks who are coming back into the community, housing is always the biggest issue. And there was a program where I worked with a few years ago where women who had um, dual diagnosis, a substance abuse disorder and now health diagnosis. So they were considered to be high risk um, for reoffending and coming back in. So there were a lot of services that they were given, intensive type services. But the thing that we could never come was housing. There just wasn't anywhere to put them. And so what would happen was folks who really weren't high risk beyond the fact that they were duly diagnosed 
who should have been living in the community, should have been living in their apartment, were getting placed in restrictive housing, like um, halfway houses mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is now I'm violating all these rules, you know. And then you're maybe getting yanked back into the. Yes, and then you're coming back in. And that's what we found when we went back and evaluated the data over three years was that the folks who were going back were the ones who didn't have housing. and. It's such a problem. And I think a lot of times they ask people, do you have a place to go? And they'll say, yeah, I have a place to go, but they're really couch surfing or they're in a place that's not safe. You know, like I, I shouldn't be here because somebody's selling drugs or using drugs and I have a drug addiction, but I have nowhere else to go. So yeah, I can go here. I mean, how long is that gonna last? It's not gonna last very long. Or, or maybe they are in a place where they are physically uh, unsafe because maybe there's a threat of sexual abuse. I mean, that's something that hits a lot of women who wind up in the system hard. And it's a lot of the uh, women that we represent at OJPC have been abused and that has impacted them. That trauma has caused them to use drugs or to, to do other things that are, uh, that wind, wind them up in the system. And again, if we're not sensitive to that stuff, we're just gonna create those dynamics again and again and again. Yeah, you know, when you're taking the only support system out, mm -hmm. even even if that person's having difficulties, you can help them through their struggles, right? right? Which then provides a different message for the child that my parent can get intervention, they can overcome these things, they can help me, I can support that someone cares, right? And they're providing these services and I can overcome this versus my parent can't help me at all and they need to be taken out of the house. And this is a very, very different message. Yeah, and that second message is one of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have hope growing up. Mm -hmm. I um, I will never forget, and I still can see it right now, when I was a junior in college, I went back to the South Bronx. I was up in New York that summer. I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, but I was born in the South Bronx. And I asked my mom, tell me where we lived for six months um, before we moved to Asheville. And somehow I found it. Those of you are way before the days of GPS. And I don't know how I get up there now, but I found it. And what I remember seeing on that beautiful sunny day in 1987 was boarded up buildings everywhere, broken glass just shimmering on the sidewalk, and young black men my age on the corners. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they were doing for sure. Didn't look like it was legal to me. Mm -hmm. And that was just a picture of hopelessness mm -hmm. that I saw that afternoon. Um, in fact, that was one of the reasons I said, I've got to, because I thought I wanted to go to law school, but I was like, I got to go to law school and I've got to represent people who I could have been. But just but for the accident of being born to parents who had connections in Asheville, and got me out of that game. I don't know where I'd been. I don't know if I'd have been as hopeful as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I was bored in Nashville, but I was hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I think so many young people, including the children of people that I represent, grow up without hope. Mm -hmm. And I think we gotta care about that. Yeah, yeah, we, we have divested from so many communities across this country and it's causing problems. I mean, people don't have jobs. There's the education system in this country is dependent upon your zip code. I mean, that's a problem within yeah, itself it too. You know, it's a lot of this, you know, we just really have to care about our neighbor and our community and what's happening around us and beyond ourselves and our immediate feeling what's happening, what's happening next door. You know, like what are what can we do to help one another lift one another up? Um, and I think this is a big part of it. You know, we have put so much on the criminal justice system. You know, we want them to resolve our mental health problems, our domestic violence problems, our child service problems, our drug problems, everything, right? Any kind of social problem, we just want to pick up the phone and call 911 and have it resolved. And that's not fair either. Mm -hmm. They were not trained to do that. That's not what they're there for. Um, and so we have really created a situation where we have expanded all this. And I think it's time to really start thinking about how we can kind of contract this. How can we reallocate resources into the community so that we're supporting resources? So we're support so that we have you have the opportunity to get substance abuse treatment in your community. 
you have the opportunity to get mental health treatment in your community. That's not true for everybody right now. You know, and when you're coming out of prison or jail in particular, you know, you're getting like 30 days of medication if you're on meds, and then it's like, good luck, it's up to you to figure out where to go from here. You know, we need to have, we have some of that here, but we need stronger systems. They're overworked, underfunded. We need much stronger systems in regards to housing and mental health and substance abuse and, and schools. It starts in schools, right? You know, thinking not just about resolving the problems that we have right at this moment, but the problems that could potentially occur, right? So talking to kids about all of this, you know, the time to start talking with our kids about drugs is way before you think, you know? Mm -hmm. So starting to talk about kids at, at a very young age about what's going on around them and having honest conversations about it, not lying to them, but you know, very honest age appropriate conversations about what's happening. And that lets you know that people care, right? When you see all that happening in your community and, you know, if you're, if you're going to schools that are, falling apart and you know, that has a message too. If eight hours a day, five days a week, you're expected to spend your day in a school that's completely falling apart with teachers that don't have the resources they need, that's sending a message to you too, okay? And it's just all around us in different ways where we need to really readdress, I think, what we're doing in a lot of ways. What would you say to people who would say, America is a place of rugged individualism and you gotta just make it on your own and stop making excuses for people who can't, who either choose not to follow the rules and choose not to lift themselves up. I mean, I hear that all the time. Right, right. Oh yeah. It drives me nuts, I just gotta say. But yeah, no, I, I spend a lot of time on that actually in the gym at the best I teach. I none of us are where we are in life because we did it by ourselves. There's not a single person that did everything on their own. I mean, you talk about the roads, but I didn't go out there and pave those roads. No, we didn't. I didn't, I didn't either. <laughs> you know, like, <sighs> none of it, we cannot do this on our own. We are not islands. Um, we all need one another. Everybody is important. Every, you know, we all have to work together to do those things. And we can we can have that talk or, you know, that, you know, by whatever you want to attitude, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not productive doesn't help anybody because if you're truly reflecting on what's going on in your life, you recognize that you are where you are because of the experiences you've had. You know, you had opportunities in school. And even if you maybe didn't go to a, a school that had a lot of funding or a great school, you could still point to teachers and coaches and, and leadership within that school who helped to make you who you are, you know? And um, there's just, none of us are here because we did this by ourselves. It's just, that's, I hear that all the time too, and it just, it, it irks me to no end because it's ridiculous to think that. I just, unless you're out in the woods by yourself, you know, eating bark, mm -hmm. I don't think you can apply that to you. It's just not, not gonna happen. I think we also do that, make those kinds of comments because we write other people off and we don't get a chance to get to know them. And that's one of the things that, I love about my work is I get to, to meet human beings um, yes. who, you know, in their most worst moments have done things mm -hmm. that are against the law and sometimes even hurt people. And when you get to see somebody and sit across from them, shake their hand or give them a hug, mm -hmm. you see the humanity and you see the connection. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think Brian Stevenson is, is big on We've got to get proximate. We've got to get get close to the people who are in the system, the people who we may be critiquing, the people who we may even want to support, and get to know them as the human beings that they are. And it just, just seems like there's this wide gulf between um, the reality of humanity and what we think of people who mm -hmm. we've got reason not to like for whatever reason. Some of that is race. Mm -hmm. um, some of that is you know, about what the person did. Some of it's class, mm -hmm. income. And I don't know. I don't know what the easy solution to that is. I know that when I bring people in prison who've never been before and they meet the people I get to represent, they come away deeply impacted. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they feel like they have gone on a field trip. It's because they've had this connection with another human being. But now they can't stop thinking. Yes, absolutely. I 
when I was a doctoral student, I had the opportunity to take students to prisons. And that was one of the things we did. We would take a whole week and I'd take them to three different institutions and then we'd come back and talk about the differences. And it, it's so powerful. It's just like study abroad. Like you really have to see it, interact with people, get to know people before you really have that impact. Um, and, and yeah, to see they're not any different than you. You, we, you know, we watch crime shows and we have all this idea that there's like this bad guy or bad girl walking around and we can identify them. We know what they look like and what they do. That's just not, that's not real life. People have very complicated stories. And you know, I remember when I went into the prison for my dissertation, I worked with women who were in a substance abuse treatment program. And I went in and I interviewed over 30 of them to learn their stories and understand where they were coming from. And, and one of the things that really shocked me was that they started using drugs at, on average at 12 was the age. Mm -hmm. And it was because of abuse, trauma that was happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't get help or you know, didn't feel like they could express those emotions. And so they turned to substances. That was a band-aid that then became the problem and then landed you here, right? So from the outside, if I'm looking at you on paper, I see a person who has maybe had two kids removed from the home, who's had a drug addiction for the last 20 years, who's been in and out for you know fraud and theft and all these different things, right? And then that's what you see, but that's not the real picture. That's not the whole picture of who this person is. There's so much more and to the to the root of their problem, to who they are, that they love their children, that they want to be with them. I mean, it, it, it's just all these different things. I think we don't do enough to interact with people who are different than us. It's really easy to be around people who are the same as us, whatever that may be, you know, gender, age, class, race. Politics. Politics, yes, absolutely. You know, all these different things, it's easy to siphon ourselves off and or silo ourselves off into these little corners, but that's what's causing the problems. We don't get to know people and really learn that people aren't really all that different. They really aren't, you know? I mean, even education level, you know, all these different things when you come apart, it, we're all really the same. We really all have the same basic needs, and we need to feel like we're loved and people care for us, and that we can thrive in the situation we're in. Yeah, you've written a, um, a textbook on race and criminal legal system. Yes, I'm really interested in your thoughts on on that. I mean, I I see it every day, and I just I, let me put it this way: when I was a public defender mm -hmm. in Washington D.C. As much as I love going to see my clients at the jail, DC jail, the worst part of it for me was walking into the visiting area and there were just all these black children and mothers mm -hmm. waiting to see their loved one. And it just, it was overwhelming. It was an overwhelming feeling um, of, of seeing all these, mostly black men walk. Mm -hmm. And I fortunately have never been locked up, about, but my brother has. Mm -hmm. And you know, one out of every three black men at some point in their lives will go to prison compared to one in 17 for white men. Mm -hmm. That blows me away. And I sometimes struggle to get, to get other people, um, white people to understand why there's a racial dimension to this mm -hmm. and why they should care about it. And it's exhausting to try, <laughs> to try. As a black person, it's exhausting to try and get people to understand. I don't, I should look to you, but I'm looking yeah. at you. No, I, <laughs> you wrote the textbook. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, there, it, this gets back to the history of the criminal justice system, you know, like what, because it's, a lot of times people will say the system's broken. I'm not sure the system's broken. Mm. The system's mm. working as it was intended to work. Yeah. And that's the, I think that's the real issue we have to come to terms with. And that's an ugly one. Mm. Mm. Because we like to believe with justice for all, right? And that we have this real law and order sense of justice that, you know, get the bad guy, they come in, they go to prison, it's all taken care of, it's wrapped up with a neat bow, and it's really ugly in lots of ways. Uh, race being one of them for sure. Class gets caught up in that too. And yeah. I, you know, I just, we're angry at poor people. Um, and we have ideas of, 
of who we think offenders are, and that gets back to a lot of media too, and who we portray as offenders. Who do we see on the news at night as offenders, right? Um, we're so focused heavily on the war on drugs and the war on crime, and we're going to go after all these folks, but corporate criminals are actually causing more harm and financial damage and all these different things. And a lot of the, the crimes that we're concerned about in regards to what we would call street crime are things that we can address um, by providing services and you know getting ahead of that, way ahead of that. Um, and But we turn our head to all these folks who are dumping chemicals in our river and you know the, the river right out here is one of the most polluted rivers in North America. I mean, that's our drinking water. You know, why aren't we talking about that on the news at night? You know, why are we so caught up on all these other things? And yeah, there's just so much to that. But I really think, you know, the system's working as it was intended to, that it was set up to do exactly this. Yeah. Yeah, I've come to that same conclusion. And that's that's ugly. It's yeah. ugly. Um, but it's it's true. And I, I don't think we can get to a point where we move to a better place if we don't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I often get hit with the, you know, stop talking about slavery. Stop talking about it. Well, I think I can draw a line from what's happening today, straight back through um, Jim Crow, through Reconstruction to 1619. Oh, for sure. It's it's there, and and acknowledging that doesn't mean that we're we're bad people currently. It's just let's acknowledge what the problem is. And I, if I could wish for anything to happen, it would be to have sustained, deep conversations mm -hmm. about how racism and poverty and lots of other isms have screwed this country up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from sure. its beginning. Oh, yeah, for sure. And we're exceptional in that way. I mean, this yes. myth of American exceptionalism, I mean, it's, we're exceptional in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. got it. Yeah, I, that's it. That's we have to own it, right? I think that really get, gets to the heart of all of us that we don't own this and we haven't been addressing this, and this is where we're leaving it up. You know, we just keep pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down. It's exploding, and it, it happens every so often. This isn't just you know something happening in 2020, 2021, right? Yeah, every, so many years we see this exploding, exploding. And this is a you know larger version. We have larger versions of every once in a while, but this isn't going right away. Yeah. No, no, it's not. And this moment we're in now, I hope I just to bring back where we started, mm -hmm. I just hope that we keep our eye on the ball. There's mm -hmm. more work to do. The verdict today doesn't solve anything. There's accountability, which is important, but we've got to keep working. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I hope that's the lesson of the day. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. Okay, well, thank you. We're going to go to questions if you uh, don't mind. And uh, if I could just uh, um, do a follow up to just that last piece of conversation. Now, this is not the first time we've been through this convulsion of the nation. Uh, people mentioned Rodney King. We could go back to the Detroit riots in uh, 1968 and the commission that followed that, that gave us a prescription on what to do. Uh, what is it that uh, keeps us stuck in neutral on this? I think that we're stuck in neutral because we have not fully reckoned with our past, which has happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about it here and there, but it's not, I don't think it is accepted by a majority, let alone an overwhelming majority, that we have deep-seated problems of, of, of racism in this country. Um, it's it's painful for people to confront that. I think I think that that's what it is. And so yeah, we get these bursts, um, isolated bursts of attention to the issue, and then you know we're not able to sustain it because there are other issues and, and, and things that demand our attention, and we just can't keep it up. And that's my fear this time is that the, the, the energy from last summer, as heartening as it was to see it happening all over the country, that, it, it's, that we have trouble sustaining where the, the work is difficult. 
Yeah, I fully agree. It's how do we sustain that? How do we keep that momentum going? And I had the same reaction when I saw it. I was like, yay, I was cheering it on. I was excited to see all these people coming out. People are educating themselves. All these books are flying off the shelves. You can't get copies of them. It's amazing. But what do you do after that, right? Do you continue to keep going and, and recognizing that this problem isn't going to go anywhere because we went out and marched or, you that's know, right. that's, that's one step that, and that's part of letting people know that you're not okay with that, right? That gets back to letting politicians know where you stand on these things. I mean, that's a huge bit of it. You mentioned that earlier, Daniel, but I think we don't turn out and vote the way that we should. Mm -hmm. um, if we care about these issues, um, then, 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 then we should. Now, of course, there are structural barriers that are being erected, uh, that have been erected, been with us for a long time. More of them are being er erected. Um, there are folks who come into the criminal legal system and are disenfranchised. Not in every state, um, Cross River in Ohio. As long as you're not in prison, you can you can you can vote. But you know, it's not it's not the same way um, in other places. And so, I think that that all of those barriers do make it hard for people to vote. But then you just get people saying, it's, my vote's not going to matter. And that's the thing that really starts to get me to lose hope is when um, folks just don't want to, they want to drop out of participation. They don't want to participate. Mm -hmm. And we can't force the change. I mean, I think that we do need to um, be vocal and, 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 and be in the streets when things happen that we need to, to get attention to. But then part of that next step is um, having an electoral strategy. Well, there's, there's no one strategy that's going to solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need the attention to the problem, but also the policy that follows. Yeah. Yeah. And the sustained action to get that policy pushed that's through. Right. It's hard. It's yeah, hard yeah, that is a lot. Daniel, you made the comment at one point that the system uh, isn't broken. It's broken it's, uh, working as it was designed to work. And David, you agreed with that and I have a question from the audience that kind of follows on that. And uh, that is one component of the system we like to think is rehabilitation. Uh, that's ostensibly the purpose uh, of, of, of for a purpose of uh, incarceration. We hear a lot about prison reform at times, but we hear little, if anything, about re re rehabilitation reform. As Professor Singleton points out, the US has high rates of incarceration. What rehabilitation systems are in place in other countries that might be models for rehabilitation to form for us? There are countries who are doing a lot of different great things, like you see things in the Netherlands and coming out of Germany, but we don't really have a system set up to be able to do that. It, I, I think when the idea behind prison is that you'll be rehabilitated, you'll receive treatment, you'll come out changed and you can get right back in. And, and all those things. But when we started bringing in all these people in the 80s and 90s, particularly nonviolent offenders, we crowded the system and there's no room for treatment. Where the treatment facility and programming was, people sleep there now. There, there's not room for that. And when you're overcrowded like that, now you have to be more concerned about security. And so now money's going to security. And so, um, and th this hasn't changed. I mean, I, I was doing my dissertation and, you know, early 2000s and at that time I was in the, I worked with the treatment program for two solid years and they had 50 people in the program and 150 people on the waiting list at any given time. And it was so incredibly problematic because what would happen is people would, um, they would have to wait until your last six months or your last 12 months or whatever it was. And then they tried to shove you in that program real quick so you got it before you left. But then you had three years, four years, five years of just sitting there and doing nothing. And so I think there's a lot of really great innovative things that are going on in other countries, but because our system is so heavily focused on punishment and we don't have the room and the funding for it, that we can't even really consider what other countries are doing and to do them here. And just to add a perspective from the work I do now, um, Try to free people who have mm -hmm. been overpunished. Um, we we try and free people who've got good records of, of rehabilitation in prison. A lot of that work they have to do on their own in terms of like um, paying for programs that 
they order and get sent, like correspondence type programs and things of that nature, because of the waiting list that you talked about. And particularly if you are in for a long time, you don't even get to see programs until you are closer to your parole date. Um, so that's a that's a real that's a real issue. And people can succeed when they have had a shot at programming. They can come home and particularly if we surround them with support mm -hmm. and opportunities rather than a whole, you know, a thousand laws on the books that say you can't do this, you can't do that. With opportunity and support, people can succeed. I and mean, we've gotten 36 people out in the past two years, all of whom were convicted of, of really serious crimes. And every single one of them was doing well. Um, but they had to rehabilitate themselves for the most part. And we were able to surround them with support in the community and they've been succeeding. Yeah, and that last part, having the support in the community, you can have a system that's set up that gives you all the support in the world, but if when you're return, you don't have anything, you're done. I mean, and that was another issue that came up with the, the program I worked with, with my dissertation was, that it was actually a great program. It's a therapeutic community. They all lived together in a cohort. It was really, they did a lot of peer work and so you could see people really grow. It was amazing. But then what would happen is you go home, nothing's changed at home. Mm -hmm. You don't have any support systems in place. They didn't have someone like your organization um, to guide them and they came back. I, you know, one day I was, I came in and everybody was in their circle and they were crying. I thought something like that. I really did. And I sat down. I was just trying to be, you know, respectful of what was happening. And what I found out was the woman who was the poster child for the program was coming back. Mm. And so who they thought like this was their head or hat song, right? And she's coming back and everyone was devastated. Everyone. Mm. I mean, now I mean, you can imagine if you're sitting there and you're hoping to succeed and you see this person go out and they are coming back. What hope do you feel like you have right mm -hmm. and the issue was that she had a drug problem she didn't have anywhere to live she went back and stayed with her 27 year old son he was selling drugs life gets what hard stress that? happens you fall back into old patterns she didn't have a support system in place so even if we have an ideal prison system until we have the community supports in place i just i don't think it's gonna work yeah I'd like uh, uh, to stay on this for a minute and connect uh, this question to something, David, that you said in your uh, remarks about voting, uh, access and right to, to vote, and also our choice to, uh, to exercise that right. Uh, policy change occurs uh, when those that we elect hear from us. Uh, and uh, so if we want reform on uh, rehabilitation, uh, voices need to be raised for that. The natural constituency may be the people who are in prison who say we need this. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what is the route to uh, uh, making this a priority for those who govern us? What you just said, <laughs> which is to make this a priority, um, Danielle said this also, we've got to organize around that. If it's, if it's something that's important, um, and it should be important to all of us, by the way, not just directly impacted people. And by directly impacted, I mean people who um, have served time in prison or have criminal records. It's in all of our interests if we care about the community, if we care about safety, if we care about prospering together, for us to address um, this issue and make sure that people can come home and that we're not just spending money warehousing people. That's what we're doing. Yeah. We're spending warehousing people. And we've got to organize around that and we've got to vote. We've got to meet with legislators, call their offices, tell them that if they don't pass, you know, this a reform measure, then we're going to vote them out of office. Um, because that's the one thing that we can count on, as sure as we can count on the sun rising in the morning, um, is that po politicians, for the most part, are about staying in office. And if they feel the pressure from constituents who really want to see us do a better job in our criminal legal system? It can happen, but we've got we've really got to got to not just complain, which is important, but exercise our our uh, our, our right to vote where we have it, and mm -hmm. where we don't, then we got to or organize to get that change, mm -hmm. like what happened down in Florida. Yeah, absolutely.
Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and part of this is about educating ourselves, right? And keeping on top of things. So when you're voting in local and state elections, knowing where people stand on these issues, you know, and going and looking those things up and finding out exactly where your representative or the person you're voting for attorney general or governor or whomever, where do they stand on these issues? Um, and it's not, I don't, it's not as easy to find, you know, crime used to be something you could stand on and be like, this is what I do. And I don't think people are coming you know, forthright with that these days. It's not as, um, as an exciting topic. And so you have to dig a little bit sometimes to find out where people do stand on the issues. But I think that's important um, when you are voting for people to know who you're voting for. That's right. Couldn't agree more. And um, so many people for a, long, for a long time, folks just wouldn't care about who the prosecutor was. Yes. It matters who the prosecutor oh, was. Yes. It matters who the judges are. It, it, it matters. And, and it may be a little harder to find out more about the judges. You got to mm -hmm. do, do some, 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 some work on that. But um, I'll say to people in Ohio, at least in Hamilton County, call us up. We'll tell, we'll tell you who, are, who the judges are that are um, reform minded. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly we have perspectives on other people in the system who stand for, for election. And mm -hmm. there are some who, who work to try to make the system um, better, and there's some who don't. And, and the one thing I want to say is we should never fool ourselves in thinking that uh, just because someone has a, a D by their name or an R by their name, that we can definitely predict how they're going to be on criminal legal uh, mm -hmm. issues. It's, it, that is not, you have to, you have to do your homework yes. and not make assumption, assumptions about how people are, are going to turn out based on their party affiliation. That's what I've I've learned the hard way coming here. Yes, I would agree too. And that's why I always say, look it up, look who you're voting for. And the, the prosecutor is so important. You know, most cases are going to be plea bargain. So right. they're really doing the majority of the work there. So yeah, having that person, knowing who that person is, is absolutely right. important. Mm -hmm. All of our questions are for both of you, but on this next question, the audience member uh, specifically says this question is for both panelists. And the question is, do you think Chauvin's conviction on the most serious charges will have any deterrence, uh, any deterrent effect? Uh, how many police officers would need to be held account accountable criminally to deter the next uh, case of abuse? You want to go first? I, I'm happy to go first. Go first. Um, I don't know that that's the problem. I, I think the, the problem is really leadership. So there are plenty of chauvins out there, um, but the rest of us have to be willing to stand up and say, this, this is what's happening. Um, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why that doesn't happen. People fear losing their job. I mean, there was the story just came out of Buffalo, right, this mm -hmm. last week? Yeah. But there was a, a woman who was a black female officer. She, this was 20 years ago, right? And she stopped another officer from choking somebody, um, saved his life probably, and uh, lost her job over it eventually. She just sued successfully this last week and got her pension and, and all kinds of things back over that. So when somebody comes to you and says, this is happening, standing up for that, thinking about leadership and culture and setting the organization, like the culture of the organization, I think is more important than, um, I mean, having this verdict is important. Don't get me wrong. It definitely says that there's some accountability that we're not gonna continue to turn our heads, but I don't think it's um, gonna really be the, the solution to keep, convictions aren't gonna bring a change away. I agree with that a thousand percent. I think that, you know, just in a lead up to the, to, to the, the, the show from Verdict, we've had a number of police involved killings across the country, some of them more questionable than others. And I think that the problems are so deep seated. It's almost like you're on autopilot. Yes. Um, in, in terms of it's the us versus them. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's race, it, it's, it's class, it's, it's, um, it's the culture that you've been talking about um, that all need to change. And I don't think that this is gonna be worth much at all in terms of the terms, to be honest. Yeah, I don't 
The next, uh, I have uh, uh, really a few questions in a row that are pretty directly, directly related. I'm going to take a couple of those and compress them into one, and uh, you'll see that the next question is kind of a follow up. But the first one is uh, broader, and that is, uh, I'm going to choose the, the, the audience members' own words because they're a powerful in their own right. Wow, this sounds so completely hopeless. Education has failed. We have put too many people in jail. Then we won't let them re enter society. They cannot find housing. The system is broken. Okay. How can we realistically get change, states to change laws that adversely affect convicted felons? I made you go first last time. How about I take this one first? That sounds like let, let, me, let me say this. I am full of hope as I see here. I am not kidding. I'm not just saying that to make the audience feel better. I am so full of hope. Um, and part of it is because of the work that I get to do on a daily basis at, at OJPC. Um, love what I do at Chase. I'm not trying to say I don't love that. But what gives me hope is, is actually representing people, seeing their humanity, getting some of them released, in working, we've been really good at working with the legislature to roll back some of the worst abuses. It can happen. Um, we got banned box done in Ohio. And banned box, for those of you who don't know, you can Google it, look it up. But it is um, a, 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 a law that says for state employment now, we're not going to ask whether somebody has been convicted of a crime. Um, when they first apply. We're gonna just encourage people to apply who may have a criminal record. And then if they're suitable for the job, then and only then are we gonna do a background check. And then we're gonna ask common sense questions about the record if the record comes back. How long ago was it? What was, what was the conviction for? How relevant is it to the job that person is supposed to do? What's the, what's the um, evidence of rehabilitation? And we got that passed. Um, in 2011, it's now the law um, in Ohio. And that was across party lines that happened. Um, John Kasich signed that in, into law. Uh, we've had some progress getting um, more ability to, for, for people coming records to get them sealed so that employers don't get to see the record if the person's moved on. We've got these things called certificates of, qual of qualification for employment now in Ohio where um, if you don't qualify for record sealing, but you're being jammed up from applying for work because you're facing one of these thousands of laws that say you can't work in certain industry and field, you can go to a judge now and say, judge, here's my evidence, here's my story of rehabilitation and transformation in the community. And if the judge agrees, you get a certificate that rehabilitates you and says to an employer, if you hire this person, you can't get sued for negligent hiring. And, and it also gets people out from under the mandatory, you can't work in this field, in this field because of your criminal record. So I say, and that, those are just a few things. And I say those because that's evidence of hope. And it just means we can't give up. We just got to keep working hard and do our best and get out there and do your part and vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully agree. I'm full of hope too. And I know that whenever we have these conversations with that, this always comes up. I had a student one semester who brought, he had a folder that had puppies and kittens on it for my class. <laughs> and he told me specifically he brought it because my class was so depressing that he would <laughs> puppies and kittens at times to like look to spirits. But I think when the, we have to acknowledge there's a problem, yeah. but also looking towards the solutions, right? So one of the things I try to do in balance when I teach is talk about here are the problems we have to acknowledge and before we can move forward. But then let's also talk about solutions. The other reason that I'm full of hope is because I teach people um, every day who are going out to work in the system. And I see that what they want to do, that they're, you know, people don't go into this field because they think they're going to be wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're not a teacher, police officer, mm -hmm. any, you no, know, that's, that's just, and if you are, you're in real trouble, mm -hmm. right? You know, and so they're there because they want to make a difference and they're growing up and living through what's going on all around us and it's having a real impact on them and they see it and they want to do better and they want to learn and they want to understand. It's a very different conversation 
in the last five years compared to 10 years ago when I was teaching. I think 10 years ago when I was teaching this, I had to convince people like this is a problem. Like, you know, race is a major issue in the criminal justice system. I don't feel like I have to try and convince people mm -hmm. of that to the mm -hmm. same degree. Um, it's more about, okay, here are the problems. Now let's find solutions. Mm -hmm. And, and I really see that in the students that we have coming out. They want to make change. They want to be better. And that's our future. Yeah, and that's a reason to be hopeful alone. Yes, absolutely. I agree. But the next few questions uh, also kind of uh, have a common theme. And I'll compress a couple of them into this one question. And that is, is there legislation that uh, is pending that you're following in the State House of Kentucky, the State House in Ohio? or at the federal level, or for that matter, in another state that you wish uh, would be brought to Kentucky or Ohio, uh, uh, pieces of legislation that uh, you wish would advance. Well, um, one piece of legislation that we are trying to get to Ohio is a second look statute for people serving life sentences. And for those of you who don't know what a second look statute is, um, once somebody gets convicted of a crime and they're serving time, let's say it's for murder, uh, some serious uh, offense, the trial judge with just a few examples doesn't have any more power to revisit the case and let the person out. And there are folks who are serving decades in prison um, for serious crimes and have changed, have, have truly changed. And they're not the impulsive 18 or 19 or 20, 21 year old who did that horrible thing. Now they're 40. Um, now they've, they've taken it upon themselves to get whatever programming they can get and they're different. And they ought to get a shot to come home. And unfortunately we've got a bad, a, a, a broken parole system in Ohio. I'm not, I'm not sure what how that works in Kentucky in terms of how awful it is. Uh, but I imagine it is probably similar. Pro boards are not are not are not um, inclined to let people out. And so the second look statute um, gives the court the power, um, usually with the consent of the prosecutor, to revisit sentences um, for people serving life. And there's a, a, a second look statute passed in California that's a model and also in the District of Columbia. Um, and we're also working on parole reform because we need a parole system that instead of continuing to go back to the crime and say, we're keeping you locked up because of the nature and circumstances of the crime, we ought to be letting people out if they've done well behind bars and we, we should be moving to what we would like to see is presumptive parole. You do well, you have, you, you know, take whatever programming you can take and you stay out of trouble, you come home and you've served your minimum time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in Kentucky, um, with the current governor, we have moved towards restoring voting rights for folks who have nonviolent crimes. It would be wonderful if we could extend that to people who have committed violent crimes too. Uh, I think it's easier, more palatable for people to say, okay, you've committed a nonviolent crime, so I'm okay with you voting. But the reality is, is that everyone has served their time yes. and they're done. Um, and if we really want people to be truly successful, we need to welcome them back. And part of that is voting, you know, to be able to vote and be able to, to change the system, right? To change what's going on around you, big part of that is being able to vote. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you mentioned about, um, if I could just follow up on one point, Mark. Is it, I'm so glad you mentioned about how you hope that that will be extended to people who've committed um, more serious crimes, because I think we throw people under the bus. Maybe it's unintentional, but we throw people under the bus when we have this you know, this, this line of de demarcation between those who are deserving and those who are undeserving based on the crime that was committed. I just think, I wish we'd get away with do it like that. Yeah, I agree. And again, it goes back to what you said earlier. You commit this crime at 18, 19, 20, 21. Now you're 40. You're mm -hmm. not the same person. None of us no. you know, are the same mm -hmm. people we were 20 years ago. And that's mm -hmm. just, yeah. Since we're uh, talking about voting rights, I'm going to skip to a question that uh, has this kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, here, here's a question. Can you address for a moment the loss of voting rights that keeps felons from participating in the political process 
Florida creates the perfect example where 65% of the citizens voted to add a constitutional amendment to restore voting rights to release felons, only to have the state cripple the effective amendment by interpreting it to require that the felon pay, quote, all fines, restitution, and fees, and quote, before they can vote. So steps forward, steps backwards, or anyway, our reflections on the Florida example. And Sure. Um, it's a step forward and a step back at the same time. It's um, I. Here's what I think. I, let me just say this: I've got strong political views, very strong political views. But I think I would much rather have full participation in the electoral process, even if it meant my candidates lost, because I think we lose something as a society when we are playing games, like what happened down in Florida. That's playing games. And I'm gonna call out some Republicans down in Florida. Shame on them for doing that. That was awful what they did. And they didn't even give people a mechanism to find out how much they owed so they could pay their fine. And so then, you know, if you, Think you paid it and you guessed wrong and you voted, you're, 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 you may be smacked with another crime. That is the kind of game playing stuff that's got to end. And, and period, period. And I think we should all want to see robust participation. And that's the, that's the part that, yes, that was a step forward, what, what that um, ballot initiative did for a big step forward. And it gets crippled by folks who are scared to have full participation. And I'm just angry about that. I don't know how you fix it other than they're gonna to have to have another ballot initiative and make clear that, it, you know, that, that you don't have to pay back all those fines in order to be, to, in order to vote. Yeah, I, I still don't understand how that's not a poll tax. It is a poll tax, but the courts just do, you know, the courts are going to do what they want to do. Right. It's just so frustrating to me because when I was just going through the courts, I was like, well, clearly this is a poll tax. So, you know, let's see how the courts like interpret it. And they're like, oh, no, it's not. And you're just like, it's the definition of a poll tax. Right. That's a little ugly secret about the law is that courts decide cases the way they want them to come out. And they're, you know, they're not immune from. The, the biases that all the rest of us walk around with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever see the Supreme Court taking up this issue? Um, I think the Supreme Court, I mean, they let it stand, um, which, which is not the same thing as taking it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this Supreme Court would probably be fine with what, what happened down, yeah. down in Florida. That's my exactly. Point. Yeah. That's in my opinion. I think so as well. A little bit of a shift. Our questions before on legislation had to do with the legislation that is pending uh, either in one of our states or federal level or in another state. Uh, this question, uh, uh, in a nuanced way, it's a little different, maybe a little more uh, uh, turned towards your idealism or what could be. The question is that while there are a lot of things uh, in our criminal justice system that need reform, what single change to the system would bring the most positive? That's like one of the questions we were going to discuss. It is one of the questions. It's the, the, it's the magic wand question. question. It is. If you could read, read the magic wand. Before, you know, everything was kind of intended by the, the court party today. But before that, what I had planned to say, thinking about that, was I don't understand why we continue to incarcerate um, nonviolent offenders the way we do. Right? It just doesn't make any sense. We're only further harming our communities, safety. Um, if we could wave a magic wand, I would have let them out, you know, and, but then you have to deal with the issues that they've been in there and how that impacts them. But let's just say, you could say they were never in there and just get those folks out. I think that would be, doesn't resolve all of it or anything like that, but it would be a, a huge step um, because the reason you're incarcerated is to remove you from society because you're harmed, right? If I'm stealing property, 
what real harm is that, you mm -hmm. know? And there are other ways to address that through things like restorative justice, mm -hmm. where you're repairing the harm, and things like that. I just feel like there's so many other ways you can address that. Yeah, I, I would also wave a magic wand for those people who've committed violent crimes who are now safe. Mm, yes, I'd yes. say, come on home. Mm -hmm. Come on home. You're no longer because you're no longer danger. Yes, absolutely. you're no longer danger. And then, if I could really have the biggest wand, I would, um, I would eliminate poverty and racism. Mm -hmm. So that. Because I think that drives a lot of what our criminal legal system is doing. I think you're exactly right. It's designed to do what it's doing. It's doing it. It's not broken. And I would want to. I would want to fix all of the systems that, 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 that pour people into into our criminal legal system. Um, that's what I do. Yeah, that would definitely have the biggest impact for sure. A bit of a shift in uh, questions. We have uh, time for a couple more questions, so we'll, we'll wrap up shortly. But uh, uh, can either of you speak to how black uh, officer violence against black suspects fits into the larger picture of race versus the police force? Sure. Um, it, it's a, it's about white supremacy, and just because you're black doesn't mean that you're not buying it. Um, you know, I think the biggest myth is that only white people have bias and racism against black people. It's, I know, I know plenty of black people who are racist against black people, um, or, or, or biased in some ways. I mean, we are all walking around with some kind of bias. We can't help it. Um, you know, based on what we see on the news and programming, TV, what we read in the, I mean, it's just, it's impossible growing up in the United States of America with this awful history that we have for all of us not to be impacted in some way. And so um, it's no surprise to me that there are um, black officers who can be just as abusive and just as, as degrading uh, as the Derek Chauvin's of the world, period. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier, the us versus the culture, right? It's the whole like the thin blue line idea. We have to stick together. It's us against these folks over here and we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and we're gonna always go in. Um, and that, that's a part of the culture, yeah, right? And that, you know, you, and if you don't participate in that culture, then you're going against it. And that causes problems, just like the woman that was lost her job in, in Buffalo that we were talking about really? earlier. Um, or Rochester, I can't remember which one it was now. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, it's all part of it, for sure. And, and that culture, that, that, that blue, thin blue line culture, that does create very powerful deterrence to doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm skeptical of what the Chauvin verdict will do in terms of deterring other mm -hmm. bad actors, but that kind of, Retribution happens um, where people lose their, lose their livelihoods mm -hmm. and they're going against the, the dominant culture is powerful. Yes, absolutely. I, I have students read an article on whistleblowers and policing mm -hmm. and the outcomes. Why people don't do I mean, people have a mortgage, they got to feed their kids. You know, I mean, like people have bills to pay. And so sometimes you have, you know, it's maybe not what you want to do, even, but you. It's the reality that this is my job and I have to do my job. There's a real sense of duty that comes along with that, too. The uh, really the final question from our audience is uh, uh, a little broader in a way is, uh, uh, Danielle, you pointed out that we need to care about our neighbors, but we live in a society, this is something of a COVID question, but also a pre and post COVID question. We live in a society now where we sadly don't interact with our neighbors like we used to. How do we fix this problem of non-involvement, of being neighbors to each other? Walk next door and introduce yourself to somebody. I mean, I really think it's, it's really that simple. Invite somebody over, uh, 
it, I feel like we're really lucky in the little town we live in that, you know, I know every, and it, it was the same for me growing up. I knew everybody on the street. Um, everybody watched out for us as kids growing up. I, I lost my pool privileges of riding my bike to the pool because someone told my dad that I didn't stop fully at a stop sign before I got home from the pool. <laughs> you know, and like just those things, like just going out and talking to people. And when you see them on the street saying, hi, how are you? My name is Danielle. You know, this is my dog buddy, or, you know, whatever it is, just have it. And, and when you see people at the park, when you're playing with your kids, just walking up to them and talking. Um, I, I think that we just have to get past that. Um, it's easy to, to silo yourself off, to not meet with people. And that doesn't mean that everyone that I walk past on the street and I say, good morning too, says it back. That's okay too, right? But you, you know, putting yourself out there and just meeting people, I think is the first step. And then I think what all of us will find is that there's actually a lot already going on within our communities and ways that we can get involved and help. And that there's a lot of folks who are doing different things, um, maybe from things like potlucks to, you know, getting together on Thanksgiving and making sure the community is fed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those opportunities you can find out through your school. Um, they let you know what's going on and how you can get involved. Um, as well as city buildings and community centers and things like that. I think there's a lot more going out here, going on out there. Um, oftentimes than we really give credit for or dig into and find out about. And I, I love all of those suggestions. And the only thing I can think to add to it is don't be afraid to, and, act, and actually seek out difficult conversations to have. One of the best things that happened to me, because I was in the, I was in my little progressive political bubble in New York and DC before my wife and I moved to Cincinnati almost 20 years ago. And I hated it here at first because the politics were different than what I was used to. I have gotten out of that bubble. I some, you know, I, let me just say, say this very briefly. Um, my, my organization worked five years to free a woman named Tyra Patterson, who was wrongfully convicted and spent 23 years locked up for something that she didn't do. One, one of the champions for Tyra, who was super helpful in get, getting the right thing to happen in the governor's office, was my former congresswoman, Jean Schmidt, who I just could not stand when she was my representative. I wrote her off. Um, we all, you know, that was her nickname was Mean Jean. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was happy when she lost. I love that woman now because mm -hmm. I've gotten to know her. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we don't agree about politics, um, all politics, but we have common ground. Mm -hmm. And I love her. I walked through a fire for her. That's how much I, I care about her now. And I think that we should have difficult conversations. We should reach across the people that maybe we're inclined to write off and, and, and see their humanity. That's, I think that's really important, mm -hmm. particularly in this day and age. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's so easy not to do it with the way TV, social media, our groups. Yeah. Know, it's really easy not to do it. It's pushing yourself to do it. But yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things we can all do is having those difficult conversations. That's how we grow and learn. Yeah, absolutely. You don't grow and learn from hanging out with people who are just nope. like you. We get stunted when we do that. Yes. I've grown because of my friendships with people like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I wonder if each of you have some uh, closing reflections. Well, my closing reflections are, let's roll up our sleeves. We're in a moment where we've got to work even harder for racial justice, where we've got to work hard to have a criminal legal system that doesn't leave the world and the number of people behind bars. Um, it's gonna take hard work, but we gotta do it. I don't think we have a choice. And I think it's, um, it's in all of our interest for us to disrupt the system that has been operating exactly as it is intended to operate. And then the last thing I wanna say, my takeaway is just personally, we got to find a way to work together more, even more, because I just, again, it's just an honor to share the stage with you. Yeah, it is you as well, David. I just feel so strongly about that. I was really excited when Mark put this together and just, yeah, I feel very strongly about that too. I, 
we can't give up hope. That's that's what I think a takeaway is, is that, yeah, there are all these problems and they seem so unsurmountable, but you can take little pieces, take chunks, you know, and, and work to do. Just getting out, introducing yourself to your neighbor, making friends. I mean, that's just one thing we can all do, right? And getting more involved in our community and supporting one another within our community. Um, looking at who we're voting for, educating ourselves. And I think with all of this work is that um, it's not a one-time thing. It's not, I do this in this month or this week or this season, this is forever. Like, you know, this is, this is a big problem and we have to continue to do this work. And it is important and it impacts all of us. And even if you don't have a personal or passionate connection to it, it impacts your safety mm -hmm. in your community. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to personally be safe, you need to do this work. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, we're going to applaud you and applaud your belief in hope. Thank you, uh, David and Danielle. Thank you, audience. Uh, and uh, I invite you to be with us again on May the 11th. We have had a beautiful season of talks here at the Southgate Street School. Uh, 10 uh, talks uh, for the season, two to go. Join us on May the 11th when Bob Wallace, who is an English professor at NKU, will talk about Frederick Douglass and the anti-slavery movement in Cincinnati. You've heard both David and Danielle talk tonight about how understanding today's issues includes a uh, need to understand how we got here and what our history is. And so uh, Bob, who has been researching a book on this subject, will uh, provide a, uh, some information on that. So hope you can be with us on on May the 11th, uh, and uh, we have one more talk after that. We're actually going to do two in May, so, uh, and then we'll be uh, taking a break for the summer and moving into next year's season. Uh, so I uh, hope to see you, and thanks for being with us. And I want to also thank uh, people that you can't see who are behind the cameras and the lights and the mics tonight, and those include uh, students who are Norse Media students. Norse Media mm -hmm is a co-curricular activity at NKU that lets our electronic media broadcast students have real world experience uh, and they're getting a little tonight. Uh, one of the things happening in their field is understanding how uh, broadcast interacts with Zoom. Uh, you're starting mm -hmm. to see that sort of thing happen uh, on television magazines. Our students are learning that and uh, we're uh, all hoping that uh, we get them for a little while and then they have great careers uh, and we're very appreciative of their help tonight. And so, uh, thanks again to Newport for having us at this uh, remarkable, remarkable place that is so important in our local history and uh, and really in American history. This is a city that was the American frontier. Uh, and what happened uh, in Newport is that people from the East who were used to plantations and slavery came here. Uh, and uh, with a legacy uh, in learning of how to run an economy uh, that they had to change a little bit. Uh, and they made that change uh, uh, and uh, not instantly, but slowly uh, to the point uh, that by the mid uh, part of the 19th century, uh, this was a very diverse uh, community and that's part of our legacy today. So uh, let's all try to understand that history together in this place that inspired generations of African-Americans, children, is part of that story. So thank you for being with us this evening.